I don't know. I have an amazing guest today. And today we are going to talk about non-duality. As you guys know, we talk about non-duality or non-dual-esque concepts in this channel. And I have someone very special with me, Akhilesh Ayer. And uh, hey, can you like tell me a little bit about yourself? How you ended up here and stuff like that? Hi, Prem. Yeah, thank you so much for having me um, having you on your uh, podcast. Um, you know, uh, I'll just summarize very, very rapidly because it's, it's a sure. long story. But basically, you know, um, I got interested in spirituality in my teens. I happened to meet a teacher at that point. Um, that was sort of my initial introduction to um, spirituality. It was in the key of Advaita Vedanta, which is, you know, the Hindu, well, one of the Hindu forms of mysticism, I would say, um, mm -hmm. that really means non-dual Vedanta, for those uh, who don't know, uh, non-dual referring to the uh, illusory nature um, of the uh, of the contrast between the experiencing subject and the experienced object. Anyway, this is getting very esoteric immediately, but um, uh, yeah. that's that started me off and, and basically took me on a 20 plus year journey, essentially, where I had to um, really discover the meaning of that for myself uh, through a lot of inner work, reading, practice, struggle. Um, at a certain point, um, I felt there was clarity, and uh, I started to teach. That was been it's been about five years or so uh, since that's been the case, and I've written a couple of books, and I've um, put out a whole bunch of videos on my YouTube channel. Yep. Uh, I also work one on one with seekers. Um, I do some group work as well. I'd like to expand that, but it's it's fairly um, it's fairly rare at the moment, actually. But it, it's probably going to be expanded at some point. Um, but uh, yeah, that's uh, that's basically that's basically what I'm about. I, I you know I uh, I take the Advaita Vedanta tradition as distilled by um, one of the greatest sages of the 20th century, Ramana Maharishi. Um, so he distilled down those ideas into. Mm -hmm brilliant simple essence and i take those uh interpretations of his and i uh kind of um give them a little bit of a contemporary twist um but basically yeah. basically i'm i am taking his teachings uh and you know he mm -hmm. himself is again the distillation of the lineage of advaita vedanta so he's not a departure from it he's a distillation of it and uh, so i filled mm -hmm. in through my, my own um practice and experiences and my own knowledge and um and represent it for today's world. Yeah, that's uh, really nice. Now I'm gonna like stir away from that, in fact. And I wanna like look at a very specific aspect of life, which is suffering. You sure. know? And I feel suffering itself is very closely related to spirituality as a whole. And oftentimes solution has a very non-dual-esque vibes. Or is or to understand why something works, you need to understand how non-duality works, at least to a certain extent, you know. So I want to like uh, at least understand non-duality through understanding in a very selfish way, you know, like I'm suffering right now. I'm not having a good time. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm holding on to something and I do not know how to let go. It feels like it's holding on to me, you know, it feels like it has a vice like grip on me and I'm almost like paralyzed right now. And uh, where do you go from here when uh, all the options given by society, the medic uh, it's like the medications given by society doesn't do it for you anymore, you know? I mean, that people turn into this as like last option, right? Sorry, could, could you repeat that last sentence? Uh, no, I said uh, we often get medicated by society, you know, like yes. YouTube, Instagram and stuff like that. But when that doesn't work to like forget about your suffering, then what? You know, oftentimes then you look into something like this, you know, non-duality, how did I end up here? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean... You know, in a nutshell, of course, non-duality addresses the topic of suffering that's central. You know, you could argue yeah. there's two different motivations that are like flip sides of a coin, really. One is exit from suffering. The other is uh, the desire for freedom, truth, basically, or truth. Yeah, truth. So these are the two basic motivations, I think, that guide seekers, and they're usually linked. Um, but yeah, non-duality, what non-duality basically says is that, you know, your suffering comes from your mistaken identification with uh a person so for example in your case it would be prem that that there is a, a profound 
identification with prey, meaning that you think you're praying, basically. You think yeah. you're praying, doing, acting, experiencing person with a certain mm -hmm. history, certain relationships, a certain future, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because you believe you are this person and this mm -hmm. person is a limited, bounded entity who is uh, subject to illness, death, various kinds of limitation, the loss of loved ones, um, all kinds of emotional experiences, many of which are negative, um, all kinds of barriers to obtaining his desires, uh, all kinds of effort and labor to obtain even the simplest thing, um, yeah. right? Because of that identification, they're suffering. Mm -hmm. And this identification is a kind of very, very special illusion that is yeah. promoted by the movement of the mind it's kind of a bit of a um a cycle because there's identification with the mind and the body that is to say this person and based on such identification uh there are um desires and fears generated that is because you believe yeah. your frame you know then you want certain things you want to avoid certain things and in service of of that desire or that fear um you uh, think basically and identify yourself with those thoughts yeah. and those thoughts in turn um, reinforce the illusion of being a separate individual experiencing doing entity. And so it is a purpose of non-dual mystical practices to put a stick in this wheel, basically yeah. it's back and forth between identification, desire, and fear um, and slow the mind down so that it can actually see what is going on. When the mind slows enough and and when it is examined with enough intensity, um, then what you thought you were turns out to be not what you actually are. What you yeah. thought you were is a person. What you actually are is the nameless, uh, inexplicable, perfectly complete uh, silence, behind, you know, that runs through everything you might say. I mean, even yeah, these, yeah. exactly accurate, but they are essentially what the non-dual traditions say you are, that you are quote unquote pure consciousness. The reality is, you know, even these words are not doing it justice. What you are is beyond words, but yeah. at the same time, it's also extremely simple and you are experiencing the truth of yourself continuously. Um, but it appears as if you aren't. It appears as if you aren't. That's the illusion. And the illusion, again, is sustained by certain problematic mental habits. Those mental yeah. habits have to be systematically broken down before the illusion can be penetrated. Mm -hmm. Okay. So so there's a lot of things there. You went basically from zero, zero journey from like noob to like no, expert level really fast. And it's just basically laid down the progression. Uh, but what I'm, well, let me like address point by point. I think the way non-dual tradition is at least propagated in YouTube, right? And people watching this, it's almost like a conceptual model rather than an experiential investigation, yeah. right? You know, and the problem with that is, so let's say, so let's say you come to me and I said, oh, dude, I'm like suffering. Dude, actually, you're not suffering. Yeah, yeah. Of course, I would never it's say a, that. Right. No, no, yeah. Well, I mean, oh, I mean, I, yeah. I know what you're saying. The idea yeah. that this is merely some concept that you absorb and imbibe, and that's it, is 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 moronic, of course. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. That's why Maharishi and the Vedanta tradition and I am big proponents of practice. Yeah. There are practices involved. You have to turn your mind away from the objects of experience systematically. Yeah. This takes work and effort over a sustained period of time. Now, for certain yeah. people who have very, very, uh, you know, pure, quiet minds, it may be a shorter amount sure, of time, sure. you know, but the point is, of course, this is a, a practice. It is an experiential, it is an experiential investigation. These intellectual things um, are merely a framework within which, you know, hopefully you're persuaded that it's worthwhile to engage in the practice, but the practice yeah. is where it's at. This idea that 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 you're you are a person is an illusion is not what my saying that is not sufficient. Yeah. You have to see it for yourself. And the yeah. only way to see it for yourself is to engage in the practices. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So so let's say so let's say I'm there and I and I and I learn non-duality and I'm like, you know what? Yeah, I think I think you know what, Akilesh, I think I had an experience. 
I, I I'm a nameless, you know. You ask me what you you ask me what you are, and I'm like I'm the nameless. You know what I mean? I like you can't explain. That's a beautiful blah blah blah. Things are happening through me, whatever, right? But let's say you had this experience. Okay. Now, what kind of relationship do you have with life now? Because still, there's like worldly activities that you have to engage in, you know, or participate in almost, right? So, so, so how does that? <laughs> well, initially. The, the one who's had, who truly has understood the truth would not ask this question. Yeah. So not me. I don't understand the truth. I'm right. not telling you. Well, you said, oh, you said, I'm the nameless. I'm this, this some experience of quote unquote namelessness is merely what I would call a glimpse. That's yeah. not, that's not the truth. That's just another mm -hmm. experience. It's useful. Yeah. But the, the actual answer to your question about what things are like, quote unquote, post self-realization is go self-realize first and then you'll find out because mm -hmm. this idea that there is a quote-unquote post-self-realization is itself asked from the egoic perspective right there's you know yeah yeah of course you know, there, there, there's 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 the distorted illusion world in which we live mm -hmm. and there's quote-unquote self-realization but ironically self-realization <laughs> is the recognition that not only did we escape from the illusory world, but the illusory world never existed. Yeah. And so we did not escape from it because it wasn't there to escape from. So, yeah, so there is, yeah. there's some paradox here that the mind cannot digest. Yeah. So this is not merely, oh, it's like, oh yeah, it's like, okay, you know, I, I'm trying to squat 500 pounds. Oh, I squatted 500 pounds, now what? You know, oh, I, I try to climb Mount Everest, I climb Mount yeah. Everest, now what? This is yeah. not like that. This is something which, completely is changing the perspective from which one is viewing these questions. So these questions are asked from a certain basic perspective. The perspective is, I exist as an individual person. Only yeah. if I exist as an individual person can you say, I was an individual person that, you know, first I was ignorant, then I was realized, now what happens? That yeah. progression is not really the truth. You know, we, 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 provisionally allow for the idea of liberation because it's yeah. important to take that concept in temporarily. But yeah. ultimately, when one is actually recognizing the truth of one's existence, the whole story is not what it seemed to be. Mm -hmm. So the real truth about what happens afterwards, quote unquote, is that it cannot be expressed in words because the idea that there's something sure. even now that is the case that you're doing yeah. is wrong. So let alone later, even right now, you're not doing anything. Yeah. Actually, you don't even need some big realization to see that. The truth is, all you have to do is ask yourself very simply, are you the one who controls the thoughts that come into your mind? Yeah, true. Clearly, no, right? You don't control the thoughts that come into your mind. You don't control the emotions that come into your mind. You don't control your circumstance. You didn't control your DNA. You didn't control your past. You don't control your present. So really, this, the truth is, without even some grand realization, you can see very clearly you're not in control. Yeah. And if you really digest that truth right there, it's practically liberation. So it's, you know, it's, um, so this idea that, well, what happens afterwards? Well, what's happening now? What's happening now is not what it seems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. I think what I'm trying to like get, get try to like get a jab at uh -huh. is I think I so, see this is the biggest problem I have, right? With I've studied non-duality as well. And I think with the community of the non-duality itself, I think it's it's almost like there's like a mental model of okay, there's like something and there's this awakening, right? And then you have like this post-awakening experience and what's like having post-awakening experience. It's all about trying to like have this awakening experience. You know what I mean? And from my perspective, at least for me, from a very egoic perspective, at least I must say, I want awakening to be a consequence. Not, not like a reward. You know what I mean? Not like a what now? Not like a reward. Not something, not, not like a goal, basically. For yeah. me, because I'm young, you have to understand okay. that as well. Okay. Right? Because I'm young, it doesn't help me in any per any certain way if I became liberated now. For in in my predicament, it doesn't make any sense for wow. me personally. And why is that? Why does it not make any sense? I, I want to indulge in this worldly activity more. 
That's about oh, it. Oh, okay. So you don't want liberation. That makes sense. Yeah, okay. yeah, right. Sure. Yeah, at, at this age, I don't want liberation and something sure. I'm trying okay. to explore, right? But I'm trying to like design my life where it's almost a consequence. You know what I mean? And I like the idea of awakening being a consequence. I don't understand. What, what, what do you mean by a consequence? Consequence as in, if you're inquiring out of curiosity and you got liberated, it makes sense in my head. But you just said you don't want liberation. You want I don't want liberation. World. Not yet. I, I don't want liberation yet. So, so for me, so let me like distinguish two different parts. Like I'm talking me from like my own thing. I'm uh -huh. talking me from like a community perspective. Okay. And I think the biggest problem I have with the community is that they're, the way they talk about non-duality and Advaita, right? It's almost like there's this awakening and there's this truth and you don't know this truth and you haven't realized it. And here's the ways to like realize this truth. Okay. You know what I mean? Yes. Yes. And I personally don't like the vibe of that. Why not? Because I feel the goal shouldn't even be to get the to get liberated. Why not? Because I think liberated liberation would happen if you just do the practice. Well, but why would you do the practice unless you want liberation? How would you get liberated if you're if you want if you're attached to getting liberated? No, no, it, that's it necessary. Makes... You need to do that because uh what happens is is that you need to gather, you see. You're currently you anybody any yeah, anyone sure. who's a seeker, their mind is attached to a hundred different things. Yeah. Okay. You cannot attach go from a hundred to zero. Zero yeah, is not a possibility for the mind. Mm -hmm. The mind has to pick one thing, which it focuses on. All the other hundred things then converge on that one. That one thing is liberation. Now, ultimately. Sure. Once you have that one thing, that one thing itself will disappear, but you can't make that happen because that's not something which is the mind cannot think in terms of zero, it can only think in terms of one. So the mind has to focus its attentions on a single goal, um, liberation in this case, sure. it directs the practice towards that all the other attachments funnel into that, weaken yeah. in the process, and then um, that last attachment will burn itself up automatically. But first, you have to have liberation as a burning goal. All the sages through all the traditions say this, liberation must be a burning desire. Uh, when you want it as much as a drowning man wants air, you will obtain it, not before then. So uh, that said, of course, you're right. In the end, it too must be given up. But that giving up will happen by itself. It's not something you can command. You cannot command zero. All you can command is one. So you must have yeah. liberation as a goal if you want, yeah. if you want it, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but, but uh, for, from my perspective, non-duality is much more than just that. Of course, I didn't, that what you're saying is I think is very classic non-dual traditional path, right? Yeah. But the problem is the desire, the burning desire for having freedom, it's like what, 0.01%? Well, it's cultivated, you see. So what happens is there's initial, there's a, there's a, there's some desire, okay? Yeah. And that some desire comes in and then someone starts reading the books, they start watching the videos, they start doing the practice. Um, mm -hmm. And slowly or quickly, depending on the person, that yeah. desire grows. So what happens sure. is the person follows these practices even a little bit and yeah. in that little bit, their mind grows a little bit quieter and they experience a little bit of peace. And in that moment, yeah. they're like, oh, this is kind of nice. And then they want it a little bit more. And then they do it a little bit more. And then the attachments around it weaken, more peace mm -hmm. is experienced, and they want it a little bit more. And the end result of this process will be, in the end, that burning desire. Once the burning sure. desire is there, they're very close to the end already, basically. So all you need is just enough to get started, basically. Yeah, and yeah. then the path will take you towards that burning desire. Yeah, yeah, sure. But I think even having that little bit of desire, I think it's a very luxurious desire to have, first of all. Why is it a luxurious, why is it a luxurious desire to have? <laughs> because think about it, right? To have even the desire to be free. And it's like all your basic needs to be have to be met at least to a certain standard. That's not true. Throughout the whole history of non-duality, you have people who have had nothing, who have, who have, who have, been interested in the spiritual but the needs are also have not been so much 
right? So, yeah, well, but the point is they had that, right? So the point is, yeah, they, they had healthier food. Is there a lot of now? things? They there, had there, like people, health- there are people who lived in the forest who had who had no clothing and lived on roots and vegetables. You know, that's that's you know roots and nuts or whatever it is. You know, people want it; they can have it. They don't they don't need anything, technically speaking. If you want God, you don't need anything, technically speaking. Sure, of course. Let's say okay. <laughs> If I go to the forest, right? Yeah. And if I, that's a path of renunciation, right? I'm basically renunci- renunciating all yeah. my worldly desires. Sure. And thus now you have. Thank you anyway. Uh, yeah, yeah. At least, yeah. And at least now your heart is open enough to accommodate this desire of freedom. Right. right. Yeah. Which, which is why, at least in the more traditional spiritual practices, uh, renunciation is a big thing, right? Because yes. to yes, yes. to to, right. to even have to even like hold that desire of I want to be free, you either have your basic needs met, right? And either have like a successful business or have like your living things sorted out and have like good social circle or whatever. And now you're like thinking there's something missing and I want something more. Yeah, I that's one way. To... That's one way of going about it. But you don't have to, right? There's yeah. many. There's there's a whole continuum. At any point, you don't have yeah. to have a successful business. You could be sure precarious you could be having a failing business and not certain sure. where your next paycheck has come from and at that moment you can say i wish i want god or i want the divine or i want the spiritual or whatever you want to call it you know yeah, yeah. at that moment you can of course you can people do it all yeah, the time yeah, yeah. in fact often it's because they're suffering that people are looking for the spiritual at that moment yeah. once things are great yeah some people will be like oh something's yeah. missing and i want something more but you know look at the bhagavad gita Arjuna in the, in this text is not a happy camper, right? He yeah, is sure. in the midst of a battle against his own family. Yeah. That's why he turns towards the spiritual, right? Yeah, and so yeah, suffering is the number one reason people turn. Actually, yeah, yeah. So, so for me, that's the aspect of non-duality I want to really focus on because I feel even if you didn't have the desire to be liberated or something. But if you're in a situation, let's say like in Bhagavad Gita, where you're in like a difficult predicament, you know, where you don't know which side to even pick. I feel even there, just having the understanding of non-duality just helps you the position that you're in and the problems that you're dealing with in a deeper way. Sure. But I mean, well, you're you're saying it has some practical benefit. Yeah, I mean, it might have some practical benefit, but, you know, that's always a dangerous thing, I feel like, to think of it as having a practical benefit. Um, because yeah. it may or may not, you know, the, the reality is generally speaking, non-dual understanding will quiet the mind some and quieter minds usually are more attentive, more concentrated, more able, more capable, usually, yep. but mm-hmm. um, there, there's, there's no definitive rule like that. No. So, you know, so we have to be careful about trying to use the non-dual or the spiritual for attaining practical goals better, basically. Like, oh yeah, I'll be, I'll, I'll have a better family life. I'll have a better career, you know? Maybe, yeah. maybe not. True. Uh, of course, maybe, maybe not. But I think that's definitely the step before even having that desire of freedom there. I mean, it could I feel be. Even if, be it, could, it, it could not be, you know. Um, who, who knows? And of the day, I feel everyone... Spiritual is, is not really... Uh, uh, it's not really ultimately for the purpose of having a better normal life. Sure. It may have a side effect of doing that for many people. Yeah. But if that's what you pursue it for, you might be sorely disappointed. Yeah, sure. Because see, I mean, even in Hinduism, right, you have a you have a distinction between, you know, the sort of Vedic view and the Upanishadic view of things, right? In the Vedic view of things, you have a whole host of rituals to obtain worldly things. You have, you know, I want children, I want wealth, I want, you know, a good family life, I want fame, I want prosperity, you know, those are all in the Vedas. And almost as a reaction to that, you have the Upanishads at the end basically saying, um, yeah, yeah, that's all superficial, right? Sure. Truth is, you are you are not defined by your relationship to wealth, prosperity, health, family, children, etc. Those are all merely the outer garment what you are on the inside is untouched by any of those things and so if you realize that fact you'll be liberated immediately from all of these constraints sure i feel hmm, you might be sorely disappointed i i sure it might be there 
but I feel you'll also be greatly surprised because I feel when you indulge in indulge when you do non-dual practices, right? I think there's an aspect of love that also plays in. You know, your your heart is more open to more experiences of life. Could be, could be. I mean, you know, right. it's it's it's. It, it just depends on how it plays out because I'll tell you, for example, right, you know, there's mm -hmm. a famous text called the Ashtabhakra Gita and, you know, in okay. it, Ashtabhakra is, you know, enlightened man, of course. And he, oh. um, he talks about how before he pursued the spiritual, he was perceived as intelligent, industrious, disciplined. Everyone thought he was highly capable. And then after he pursued the spiritual, people thought he was dumb, idiotic, yeah. you know, good for nothing, lazy, you know, yeah, yeah. So, so this could be the effect, you know, yeah. the, 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 the Zhuangzi, which is a famous um, Taoist text, talks about how uh, the spiritual person is like the crooked tree that is good for nothing. You know, it, it cannot be used for wood. It cannot be used for fruit, you know, and that's why it survives because it has no normal usage, you know. So there's something yeah. beautiful about not being useful in the world basically so you know it can okay. be the case that the spiritual person is useful in the world of course but um yeah. but we should be very very careful about getting things confused because people otherwise what happens is people want to use these practices and they they want to try to adapt them or use them for uh for worldly purposes which you know which may or may not work that's all you know it, it, it might or might not you know it may take you on a very, very, uh, <laughs> it, it might take you on an extremely strange detour, you know? Um, yeah. And anyway, the truth of the matter is, I don't think anyone can actually seriously pursue the spiritual path if their real underlying aim is money or health yeah. or something like that. You know, yeah, they, they won't have the motivation to stay on it, basically. Yeah, yeah. Like for me, I don't know, I'm being honest here where I'm saying like liberation is not my number one thing, right? So for me, freedom is like, sure, I feel I can become, I can, I can have this experience when I'm 60, I feel. Or maybe the next lifetime, you know, where is this going to go? Like, of course, right? But for me, it's like, uh, of course, this is a play. I'm enjoying the play. I want to understand it better. But I, I see a path in non-duality or, or, or I see a space where, where your heart is more open for compassion, you know, compassion, kindness, and it's yeah. more open to suffering, in fact, which right. of course, which is the reason right. why your heart is now more open to compassion, kindness, and stuff like that. And whenever you are dealing with suffering, right, your heart needs to be open to, to show compassion and to not resist it, to allow it, to surrender, which is yeah. basically the same yeah, yeah. mechanism that goes into pursuing the truth, right? Is, so there's you know i would say there's a, there's an aspect of it there's an overlap you know so there's there's yeah. there's um you know it's it's an interesting point you know so so there's certainly and i often talk about this with my students um there's a large part for a lot of people of emotional blockage that, sure. that affects the work usually my recommendation now to people about that is go get psychoanalytic psychotherapy a very specific kind of therapy psychoanalysis or psychoanalytic psychotherapy which looks deeply into the unconscious over a period yeah. of time that therapy you know can have the consequence precisely of opening ourselves up more to compassion like you're talking about yes. and you know the sort of more ancient versions of this you know which is it's not the same as therapy but they were oriented towards some of the same stuff um would be things like you know in Buddhism, the idea of um, uh, loving, compassion, meditation, um, right? And, um, you know, even in Hinduism, you know, uh, thinking like everything is God, you know, and and, and trying to cultivate love for, for other people and, um, and, and things like that. Those are what I would call um, em emotional, emotional preparatory practices, you know, so there, I think you are right that um, that those practices, but those practices are not like the 
um, highest peak of the non-dual practices. Yeah. Like the, the base, the base, the mm -hmm. mountain. So that base, which is dealing with emotional openness and things like that, um, which is important. Um, yes. Uh, it, it can help you enjoy life more. I agree with you on that point. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes. Because of course, I think, uh, you could always just renounce and just take the high road, you know, which I feel is almost like the highway. Sit in a cave. Who am I? Straight, you know. Well, you don't have to sit in a cave to do who am I. You can you can do who am I what, sure. in, in 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 ordinary life. Yeah. The, the cave is mental. You see, the actual yeah. point is, can you turn your attention away right here, right now? That's what's important. Um, yeah. That's what I tell my students. You don't have to go to a cave. You can go to a cave if you want. Some people go to caves. Nothing wrong with a cave, but you don't have to go to a cave. You can be right here, right now. And simply turn your attention um, towards uh, towards the eye or, yeah. towards, or away from objects. Sure. But but what you're talking about again is this you know the cultivation of compassion and all that cultivation of an open heart um, is more from tempted to say moral practices, emotional um, emotional self awareness. Uh, yeah. Yeah, those kinds of things, which are helpful to the spiritual, of course, because what happens is when you are more emotionally aware and more connected with yourself and more connected with other people, um, there's less inner conflict and less inner conflict means a quieter mind. A quieter mind means easier to do the practice, the, the yeah, higher sure. practices. So so everything depends on uh, that ultimately. So so yes, and, and yeah, for those emotional emotional awareness kinds of practices, emotional awareness slash compassion, those are related, right? When you're more able to be emotionally accepting of your own weaknesses and complications and imperfections, which is not an easy thing, um, then you're going to tend to be more capable of being open to other people's suffering and to be yeah. compassionate towards that. Together, that does make life better and it also helps the non-dual practices themselves but they're yeah. not exactly the same thing i would say they're a, they're a, like a um again they're like other sensors does their foundation yeah. on which um these other yeah. non-dual practices are built yeah. I, I feel i feel I, I feel the way the kind of practice that you're talking about the traditional non-dual practices it's like you're almost like battling the final boss right yeah sure well but, but you can if you have the desire so, for it, you can, you know, yeah, I, of course, start with that. Yes, you can, you can, you can start there. You're right. People, people yeah. don't necessarily, people don't, people aren't necessarily all built for that immediately. hundred yeah. percent. I agree with you. And, and but, they may have to deal with the more emotional stuff first. Yeah. Yeah. But I feel the, um, the, the reason I bring up is what's interesting is about non-duality and where it really helped me is the, the mechanism between battling the boss mm -hmm. is basically the same. It just happens to be like a bigger boss and it happens to be stuff that it's very hard to be mindful of. For example, for example, let's say I'm suffering, right? It's, it's, it's fundamentally happening because there's a part of me that feels like has more control over me and I and I have a loss of control, but I have a desire of control, you know? Okay, it's sure. like if, if I try to like control, if it's raining and I'm like, yeah. I, I really desire, damn, why is it not sunny? Yeah. Right? I'm going to suffer because what is is happening but my idea of what is is different sure right and i think my idea should be reality yeah and what the actual reality is you're saying that is not the reality so that dissonance right of course so that dissonance itself is causing suffering right but that's that's basically happening because there's a separation between you and it of course and then you have the idea on top of that saying that your idea of what it should be is more real than what it actually is right Yes, right. So, so, it's, so that is like that is non duality, basically the same dynamic, right? Sort of. So, so I mean, there is a relationship for sure. For sure, there's a relationship. But, um, but I'm I'm hesitating because mm -hmm. see, um, how do I put this? Accepting that it's raining, right? Sort of just saying, you know, the. the yourself that wants it not to be raining and the fact that it is raining is indeed you know a cause of your suffering this you might say it's a psychological cause for suffering you might might say well why why are you built in such a way that you want it to not rain when it is raining right 
you know, what, why was that the case? Maybe it's from your childhood um, sure, from, sure. Or, or things like that, you know? Um, if you can, of course, you know, uh, um, change your psychological structure so that you no longer want it not to be raining or you accept in some sense, you know, um, the fact mm -hmm. that it is raining and that you can't do anything about it. Um, does that make you, uh, uh, um, does it make you suffer less? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. But, but, um, mm -hmm. reason I would say this is not exactly the same as the peak non-duality stuff is because, see, um, um, the, uh, the, 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 the highest non-duality practices are not really exactly about adjusting um, desire to expectation, uh, or, or sorry, I should say expectation to reality is what I meant to say, or, yeah. or desire to reality. It is rather recognizing that that entire structure of desire versus reality yeah. is not you. So, 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 yeah, the, yeah, it's okay. I see what basically you're saying. built into the very yeah. structure of the mind, there is this division. Yeah. So, yes, that's the, uh, can we can we reduce the division using various psychological means? Yes, we can. But, but nevertheless, there are going to be certain things that are and should remain yeah. intolerable in some sense. Yeah. Why? Because, because, because that sense of, I want it to be something different is actually not a bad thing. That sense I want to do something different is actually a, a link down into uh, the hunt for the truth. Because, because in fact, things are actually complete. You see, okay. so there's one way where you are adjusting your desire to the imperfect reality and yeah. then reducing suffering. That is a psychological way, which is fine, sure. which is good, sure. which is necessary. You know, yes, accept things as they are. But then mm -hmm. the spiritual is saying, no, 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 that's only one movement. The other movement is um, you misunderstood what reality is. Reality is, in fact, perfect. Yeah. It's not merely that you have to accept its imperfections. It is perfect. And there is something being that doesn't appear perfect to you because you have blinders on. So you have to cut those blinders away. So mm -hmm. there's a distinction between those two things. Now, the first thing can help you with the second thing, because if you can, if you can learn to accept more of the imperfection in reality, then you will be more able to pursue the higher level mm -hmm. on dual practices. But yeah. ultimately, on dual practices are saying, no, 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 no. Death is not real. Suffering is unreal. These are all uh, these are all fictions in a way. Yeah, you can come into touch with something which is in fact utterly complete and perfect. It's not yeah. really a matter of accepting. That's only one level. Uh, okay, so a lot of interesting points. But let me ask for the first question here. Now I'm now I'm curious. Now I'm like really curious to understand here. So accepting right so my idea let's say it's raining so this is my idea and you can correct yeah. me if i'm wrong i want to understand your perspective of where i'm like maybe going wrong so let's say it's raining but i want it to be sunny yeah okay and let's say i accept it and i think when you do acceptance correctly it shouldn't matter your state of being shouldn't matter on whether it's raining or sunny i think when you really accept it whether it's either raining or whether it's sunny it wouldn't affect you in any certain way. It, it, if you, yeah, sure. If, uh, if you can come to a state of perfect acceptance, you're my assuming, understanding of course, a lot of things that are assuming, for example, that you that you can always come to such a state. Usually, coming to such a state involves effort, it involves time, yeah, of course. Involves uncertainty, right? Yes. And and underlying this question is, why is it so difficult for me to come to that state? Yeah, true. Right, and then I accept that too. Oh. Uh, well, it's just difficult because that's the way things are. That's like a, a meta meta version of it's raining, you know. <laughs> sure. So Very right, much and on and on yeah. and on, right? So um, yes, you know, if you can if you can reduce your desire to accord with the imperfect reality, to the extent you can do that, you will reduce your suffering. One hundred percent agree. I, I, but that's not but, the I'm trying to say that's not the only way. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, but but here's where I'm making the leap in logic. But yeah. I'm saying the reason it is reducing the suffering because I'm dropping a part of my identity, not the entire identity, a part of my identity that is attached to a specific aspect of reality. 
or a specific um, aspect of reality where it should be this way or something like that. It's where I'm saying, and I could be, I'm perhaps, co- concluding I mean, basically. I guess I, I mean, maybe it might be a semantic, it might be a semantic issue because the thing is, it's, you know, you know the way I see it is, um, mm-hmm. um, you know, whether you want to call it dropping your identity or identifying with the acceptance of yeah. quote unquote reality is a semantic issue. Um, but um, ultimately there is nevertheless a qualitative divide between you know, the individual mind who is selectively quote unquote dropping certain identi- identification yeah. 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 and True. recognizing the illusory nature of individual at all so so yeah. that that there's a big division between those two mm-hmm. so it's so let me rephrase really a continuum basically yeah so let me rephrase what you're just saying so that make sure i understand it properly yeah. so you're saying even though this might be your yeah you're dropping a part of your identity it's it's like you're p- dropping a part of like a higher level identity right but it's, but the underlying assumptions still remain yeah. the same which is that yeah. there's a doer and yes. there's a doing and yes. there's an experience and yes. then you exist, I exist and yes. it all happens within yes. this drama, right? Yes, yes. And, it's, yes. and and I think what you're talking about is like the difference between a character in a movie dropping a, a certain aspect that, oh, you know, this doesn't serve me or something like that versus the character realizing that, oh my God, I'm not actually a movie, I'm a, a member in the audience seat. Yeah, right, exactly. And, yes. and this, yes. and this like a, even even with even with the specific even with the specific attachment okay I mean, even there even there i could i could i could draw a question again i think it becomes very yeah quibbling about words but but in my opinion there is a difference mm-hmm. between let's say so cuz raining outside you have the desire for it not to be raining right sure. so on the one hand you could again adjust your desire so that i no longer want it not to rain Mm-hmm. Okay. that's again i would call like a psychological modification of your desire versus recognizing at some level that this desire for it not to rain and the consequent suffering that attends that desire is yeah. not me. is not me so if you want to talk about partial dropping of identification I would prefer to call that partial dropping identification, that this desire and the suffering that are about that desire are just images. They're just thoughts. They're not yeah. actually defining me. So if you have that understanding, that is a partial dropping of identification, I would yeah, say. Yeah, true. Right. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Different, yeah. different than different than no longer having that desire. You see yeah. that? Yeah. Uh no longer having that specific desire, you might say, whether I want... Yeah, yeah that specific desire, exactly. Yeah. So there's two different ways. One is you get rid of that desire. Now you're no longer in conflict. Or the second way is I don't see that desire as part of me anymore. So yeah, it's there. And yeah, there might be pain attached to it in the abstract, but I view them as just thoughts. I see they're not really me. They're just mm-hmm. thoughts. So if yeah. you have that recognition of that in the moment, then for that mm-hmm. moment, you are de-identified you might say with that situation True. so it's like looking at a painting it's like looking at a painting of someone having you know this desire for it to rain you know for sure. not to rain when it is raining you know yeah, yeah okay so it's interesting i want to ask you one question here uh so i feel there's like a difference between and you, and you spoke in a youtube video which was like really amazing and i really like the way you put it it's like the difference between uh surrendering uh accepting mm-hmm. okay and i think i'm i'm putting another one here which is like letting go yeah okay oh did i say okay, okay. i may have said all three possibly different no. <laughs> uh, uh, maybe the words were different but sure. in my head i think let for example you can only let go of something you're holding on to right sure so there's like a conscious action there or, sure. or like uh, there's a desire of me having a pleasure right so there's a conscious holding on to clinging. Any conscious yeah. clinging you can let go of, right? But you can, sure. cannot let go of something that's happening to you. That's where you can accept, right? Or surrender, basically. 
So, right. well, well, I'll just say really quickly, right? So in yeah. that video, I'm pretty sure I definitely, what I was probably mentioning by acceptance is something like dropping desire for it not to rain. Yeah. Right? Right. Okay. I want it to be sunny. Dropping that desire for it to be sunny would equal acceptance in that video. And I was trying to say that surrender, as I was defining it, see surrender, I use that in a very technical, as a very technical term, as one of the two major practices that I teach you know, that are from mm -hmm. my region. And, and so surrender, I defined it as basically ignoring thought and uh, relaxing the willpower, but in a way that's highly vigilant where you're continuously doing this and you're defending this position. So, yeah. so what I was trying to distinguish is exactly what we just talked about a couple of minutes ago, which is, which is that when you surrender, what you're doing is you're saying, okay, this thought that it's still rainy and I want it to be sunny and I'm finding it painful that it's not sunny because I want it to be sunny, but it's rainy, right? Surrender in my language means mm -hmm. that one looks at this whole set of thoughts and recognizes these are just thoughts. These are not reality, and I have nothing to do with them. They're just like irrelevant. So, 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 yeah, these thoughts occur. These feelings occur. These thoughts and feelings can occur. I'm not telling them to not occur. I'm not telling them to okay. stop. I'm not telling them, I'm not saying they're good and I'm not saying they're bad. I'm not saying they should continue and I'm not saying they shouldn't continue. I merely mm -hmm. recognize these are all thoughts, not me, irrelevant. That is that surrender versus quote unquote acceptance, which is more of a psychological thing where you change or changing your desire. I no longer have the desire for it to be sunny. You know, now I've accepted quote unquote that it's raining. And yeah. that's, so that's a different thing that's happening at the level of within the image versus yeah. outside the image. This is just an image, you know, that's so that I see it just as an image that's yeah. if I'm changing what the image is itself, that's acceptance. Yeah. Okay, cool. So it's interesting. I have a, a small thing. Uh, I'm, I'm understanding you currently, but maybe the words that you're saying maybe doesn't uh, correctly map onto the experience of surrender you're talking about. So let okay. me like rephrase this a little sure. bit and see whether your, it still matches your definition or not. So by surrender, at least to me, and at least the way you put it, even now in the way of a video, it feels like there's a lot, like a loss of will, right? Like it's, it's more like, it feels like, you know what? It's raining, do me. Oh, whatever suffering is like, just I give up. Almost like that. You know what? Surrender uh, almost. Like, yes. Traditionally. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, you, yes, 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 yes. I'm, I'm under your care. You want to kill me, kill me. You want to like love me, love me, whatever. But yes. I have like no desire like to put something inside you. Right? Well, like, or to manipulate. I, I, right? I would say I would just be precise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. basically, yes. Sure. But I would just be precise. It's not exactly you don't have any desire. It's that you're refusing to use your willpower. Yeah. So, so anything which feels like my deliberate decision, that muscle we are relaxing. But ironically, we are, uh, we are, we are making the effort. We are using the willpower on the practice of surrender. So that practice itself requires effort and willpower. But all other willpower we are withdrawing. Yeah. Okay. So we're because saying, of spontaneous situation, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. I'm not going to act. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, no, because when you when you're using words like that, in my head, and if someone is watching this video, I think you're talking about. Let's say there is there is this is the image and this is you, right? So I think surrender comes in this perspective, right? Where there is you, there's this, and you're like playing with this dynamic. But I feel when you're just looking at the image like this, and I feel if you try to let go from within the image, right? And if you like try to like, if the thoughts arise and you kind of like resist, I feel like then it persists even more. I think it becomes even more stronger. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, if you're within the image and you, and so if you, and you try to like, if you don't resist, recognize, if you do not recognize that it's an image, then yeah. you're absorbed in the image. If you're absorbed in the image, then if you try to resist reality, you're right, you will promote suffering. Yeah. So, so from your perspective, it's like, and you can correct me in the semantics, it is like surrendering is like a recognition almost. Right. And I'm trying to recognize. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a practice, right? So there's, so there's, there's a practice, technically speaking, it is within the image, you know, is a very, very peculiar state because sure. you are within the movie in some sense, but anyway, at least so it seems. 
um, but you are trying to actively dissociate yourself from the character in the movie. That's what surrender is. Surrender is saying whatever happens in the movie otherwise, let it happen. And that includes, by the way, my desires or yeah. my pain, my suffering, all of that stuff, right? Both external reality and internal reality can continue however they like. Yeah. I am trying to just wash my hands of it and say, I'm not, I'm not involved. Don't try to don't try to make me into that character in the drama. You know, of course, arguably it's a character in the drama that's doing this, but that's a separate issue. So, you know, that that that's that's an illusion uh, anyway of sorts. But sure. um but uh but the point is that's so that's what's going on. Does that make sense? It makes sense, but I'm trying to understand where is the fine line between me resisting that you exist. Let's say if I think you exist, right? If I if let's say if I think you exist, of course, in my perspective, you exist, right? But then from this perspective, I say, you know what? I'm just going to like act as though you don't exist. No. no. And, and I not, think there's not, like a not, difference what, there, right? That's not what surrender is. Surrender is, it's not acting as if you don't exist. It is, it is ignoring thought, which is different, right? So, because what would it mean to act as if I didn't exist? That requires further thought. There are thoughts that are coming to you like, oh, I'm talking to this person on Zoom. Um, uh, what should I say next? Blah, blah, blah. Those are all thoughts that are issuing into your mind, right? Surrender is not saying, treat this person as if they don't exist. Surrender is saying, these thoughts which are saying, what should I do next? Should I act as if he exists? Should I act as if he doesn't exist? All those thoughts, treat them, all of them as irrelevant. All of them as irrelevant. Meaning, I will not engage with any of them. It doesn't mean that I act. It does not mean that I do not act. It does not mean that I act. In... It means that this idea that I'm the one who's acting, I'm refusing to believe in that idea. But I, but I feel if you believe in the idea and then refuse to believe, I feel there's an underlying implication that you believe in, you believe that you believe that it exists, right? You believe that it's real. And you're refusing that fact that it's real. It's like me looking at a reflection and thinking, oh, my hair is black and trying to like refuse the fact that at least that's how it's coming off. That's how things, I'm trying to... The thing is, it's the mind, you know, it's the it's the mind which is believing it's real. You're not the mind. That's what Surrender is going to show you. It's as if you're reading a novel. Okay. Okay? I often use this metaphor over and over again. Sure. You're like reading a novel, okay? Yeah. And in the novel, the character is talking to someone over Zoom. Okay, a fictional yeah. character in a novel is talking to someone over Zoom. And you read in this novel, this character thinks, what should I say next to this person? Yeah. Right. Now, you who are the reader of the novel, yeah, have nothing to do with the answer to that question. Yeah. If you somehow think I have to answer that question, you have made a an error where you now believe you are the character in the novel, but you are yeah. not the character in the novel. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what the what the character does or doesn't do. It doesn't matter what the character thinks or doesn't think. It doesn't matter yeah. if the character believes or doesn't believe. In fact, the character doesn't believe anything because the character is not real. The character is just a set of words on a page. Yeah. There's no such character actually. So, okay. So so basically what you're saying is surrendering is basically cultivating a witness. I don't like that terminology because because even the idea that I'm witnessing is also a thought. Surrender is trying to move away from thought. Surrender is trying to redirect your attention away from all thought. And the idea that I'm watching is also a thought. So let's say you're redirecting your uh, attention away from thought, right? Yeah. So let's say when it's away from thought, then when the attention is on something, then what is it? Well, then then it's then it appears to be on something. But the idea, in fact, that it's on something is itself a thought, actually. There then, is something very you see, there is a then what? Uh, no, yeah. So then it's like there's my attention. Yeah. It's it's coming on a thought. Then I'm like, no, nah, bro, I refuse, right? Yeah. Goes on the right. next thought. Yeah. Then I'm like, bro, I refuse. Goes on the yes. next thought. 
So are you saying, assuming that no thought repeats itself, right? Assuming that no thought repeats itself and I like keep refusing to like believe thoughts, in the end, there'll be like a moment where, I don't know, the thingy. Yeah, well, there's, there's, that, there's an, you're, you're trying to get out of, there's an illusion, there's an illusion yeah. of self that is being yeah. propagated by your believing these thoughts. When I say believing these thoughts, really what it means is you're, uh, you've forgotten that it's just a thought. You believe it's real. Just like when you're reading the novel, if you forget you're reading the novel, you forget you're reading the novel for a moment, then you're absorbed into the novel. Yeah. So we're trying to have a position with respect to our own mind where we never forget that this is just a thought, set of thoughts. We keep, this is just a set of thoughts. Whatever's happening, this is another set of thoughts. Whatever I'm feeling, whatever I'm seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, thinking, imagining, dreaming, these are all thoughts. These are not reality. It's exactly like a novel. I do not have any role to play in any of these things. So keeping this understanding continuously going and reminding ourselves of it 24 seven, basically, every second, not allowing ourselves to forget even for a moment, right? That yeah. this is unreal. That's what surrender is trying to do. When you do that long enough, you know, you'll find it's it's not easy, right? Because, because yeah. there's resistance to it, because there's resistance based on identification. But slowly those resistances will be worn away. And once they become weak enough, then um then it will turn out that the 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 structure of the illusion will break start to break down. Just like, you know, if you have one of these um you know, flip books, you know, you flip book yeah. and it seems like there's there's a drawing that moves yeah, yeah. because you're flipping at a certain speed. Once mm -hmm. the speed becomes slow enough, the illusion breaks down. So in a similar way, when you surrender continuously enough, which takes time for most people to build up to that, um, then eventually the illusion will break down, the illusion of self that the thoughts are sustaining. Okay. Uh, I, uh, what the... Mm, just give me one moment. What I'm trouble understanding still, I understand the concept what you're saying, but how do you, first of all, I don't understand why someone would do this. If you think about it practically, right? There is, I can't think of like a desire to have where I'd be like, you know what, anything that comes up, boom, gone. Apart from maybe freedom or something. Well, it's, like what would motivate someone to, what would motivate someone to even do this? Because what you're right, saying, like, right. say, well, seems to have like no. Well, yeah. it's because, because they want, if they want, if they want liberation, if they want, if they want access to the most perfect happiness available and if they yeah. want access to ultimate truth you know yeah. this is one of the prime ways of obtaining that because those things are only through uh obtained through cutting through the illusion uh very very profound magical illusion you know the truth is what is being spoken cannot really be fully understood by the mind you know there is a paradox in it inherent in it and 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 uh you know we can only own it we cannot actually speak it directly but for those who feel that they want um that they want something which is permanent which cannot be taken away from them which is not subject to circumstance um yeah. you know which which is an exit from the from the pain and effort of life um that is that is true and um, secure. Uh, this is the only way. And for those who want to peek behind the curtain and see, in some sense, what reality really is, you know, yeah. behind our imperfect human knowledge, you know, um, this is okay. I get it now. Yeah. So yeah. you're saying that the 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 driving desire is basically distinguishing reality from falsehood. Truth from falsehood, you might say. Yeah, either truth or a desire for perfect happiness or or exit from suffering, basically. Okay. Uh, are you familiar with the David Go Hawkins? Yeah, very no? I know. Very, he, he, yeah, he wrote a book called Letting Go. And the entire Letting Go method is like in this one sentence where he just says surrender to God. Anything just happens, surrender to God is what he said. Now, I don't understand. Yeah. I don't understand what that means because first of all, God is in, you know, yeah right i mean Whatever. and then surrender is like oh, what do you want me to do you know like join a church i don't know you know what i mean 
Right, uh, right, right. Well, so, so I mean, I've, I mean, you, if you follow, if you want to follow the method I've I've defined, no, it's very uh, good opera- I'm telling operationalization you, of surrender. You know, no, I don't understand what the method is. So, so when he says surrender uh-huh. to God, what do you understand from that message? Because I don't understand what he means when he says. I mean, what it, I don't I don't know what he means. I can't comment on what he might. Yeah, mean, sure, sure. Okay, but, but when I say that to you, it's like, what do? Yeah, how sure. Do you I like, mean, well, I mean, the obvious, uh, obvious you know, face value idea of it is whatever comes, you just, uh, you just accept it one way, to, one way or the other, you basically, you basically quell your willpower. It's exactly what I've said, right? So you allow whatever happens to happen, both internally and externally, without using your willpower to try to change it. You surrender, surrender, meaning you let go of trying to change anything. Yeah. Even even if you have desires to change, again, technically speaking, yeah, the desires course. to change can stay. They don't have to go. Only your willpower has to relax. Interesting. So 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 taking the frame and you're telling them to chill, basically. Yes, continuously. You know, a metaphor that I use with some of my students sometimes is, um, it's imagine you're you're like a royalty, okay. And your sure. only job is sit on this throne. Yeah. You're going to have a lot of voices telling you, get down. You've got stuff to do. You have to do this. You have to do that. Go fix this. Don't you want that? You know, they're going to try to lure you off your throne and make you do things. Mm-hmm. Your job in surrender is ignore all of them. These are all mm-hmm. lying to you. And you just continuously chill exactly like you're sitting on a chair okay only those things which happen involuntarily right the okay. mind and the body will continue to do things but they'll continue to do things accidentally and involuntarily those things alone should happen mm-hmm. never ever with what feels like you involved your effort is just dedicated mm-hmm. to making sure you do not believe these lies essentially that's also okay. right So, okay, so let's go a little bit deeper here and let's investigate, okay? So there's an assumption that you made here where you said, let's say I'm sitting on the throne. You have the voices coming inside you and the voices are essentially lying to you. Right? Yeah. Makes sense. But here's the thing. Here's a here's a big, big question, right? Which which is what your this thing depends on. Is that how do I now recognize? Like how does one now recognize whether this thing is a lie in my direct experience, you know what? Because I don't want to go with your word. I don't want to go, oh, this is lying because Achilles said so. You know what I mean? Well, I want, I yeah. want to like, I want to like see it for myself that oh my god, this is lying to me in my own direct experience. Right. Well, you'll see it. Well, there's a bit of a catch twenty two. So, so um, surrender in particular is a more faith based practice, right? So, um, so, so. You have to accept. You have to accept this is the truth based on teachers or scriptures, and then you will see for yourself at the end. Okay, you will experience for yourself, but you have to believe for for quite a while. If you do not want that situation, okay, yeah. then, then that's fine. Then you have then you have to adopt <laughs> methods of self inquiry, which are different. So self inquiry oh. is self inquiry is going to be more like who am I, as you know, and and where you're hunting that sense of I. Where what exactly you know? I know I exist. I know I'm aware. I know I'm here. Interesting. What is that? Right. So that curiosity does not require nearly as much faith. You can just hunt it and 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 um, yeah. But even oh. then, some degree of faith will be required. Why? Because you will have to have faith that this process of hunting the eye yeah. is itself worth it. Yeah, yeah, you sure. So, because in the process of hunting the eye, if you really want to find it, so to say, um, you will have to dedicate the same level of intensity as you would yeah. in that total surrender. Sure. So in the process, you will oh. be ignoring everything in ordinary life. Makes sense. That makes a lot of sense because I actually never made a distinction between self inquiry and non duality. I just kind of like put them in the same bucket. Yeah. Because I specialize in self inquiry, mm-hmm. and that's what I personally use. If you know, if you like, but, but that's why surrender to God never made sense to me, because from a self inquiry point of view, I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know what surrender meant. 
and right. also like what who's god like uh, what I'll do i you, mean by right i'll tell you very quickly you know um what i get in with tell my students even though i just gave you a difference you know which is based on one is more faith based one is more curiosity based sure. one is more oriented towards suffering that's surrender one is more oriented towards truth that's inquiry but still yeah. the reality is in fact they are really two sides of a coin why is yeah. that because again when you do surrender what you're doing is you're trying to uh uh continuously move your attention away from being absorbed in objects or thoughts okay mm. when you do that towards what is your attention inevitably going it's the question if it's away from objects where would it go yeah the subject is the answer meaning the experiencer so when you surrender, what you're doing is you're continuously recognizing, you're objectifying things. When you objectify mm -hmm. things, you are, you are moving in the direction of yourself, whether you know it or not. When you do inquiry, you are trying to say, what is this sense I have of my own existence? What exactly is it? And you are hunting that. And as you hunt that, in order to pursue that, you are having to, you know, so many, um, so many things arise which are actually not you. They arise in yeah. your mind. Each of those things, you have to say, this is not me. This is not me. This is not me. So what am I? So what am I? So what you're doing is, as you hunt yourself, thoughts are arising and you are ignoring them. Yeah. As so, a consequence, right? As a consequence. So you are effectively surrendering them is what you're doing. So, so even mm. though they're slightly different, they are really essentially the same. In inquiry, to pursue the I, you ignore the objects of experience. In surrender, to ignore the objects of experience, you are moving the direction of I. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, that's interesting. So so would you then tell, then would you make a connection or the conclusion? Because I'm, I'm taking a leap in logic here. Because then if I look at the dynamics of bhakti yoga, right? Yeah. Where you do the same thing with surrender to God. Yeah. And then the final step is you're just putting your attention towards God. And in that process, basically like surrendering all your worldly attachments, right? Or whatever attachments you have, right? It's basically the same dynamic. It's like a faith-based thing, right? What yeah, I mean, so surrender versus surrender to God is 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 um hardly different. Okay, it's just a slight flavor difference. That's all. Mm. Because 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 what you're doing is even God is God is not your idea of God. Yeah. Said, right. Sure. So when you when you truly surrender to God, you have to drop even your the idea that you can imagine of what God is. God is the unimaginable. So so yeah. you have to you just have to ignore all of those thoughts. Basically, that is true surrender to God. It may start yeah. out with a more form based idea of God, you know, or it can start mm -hmm. out with more like you know a particular deity that you're worshiping. Nothing wrong with that. It's actually a good thing. Yeah. But um. And you can sure. pray if you like and things like those are at certain additions. But basically, fundamentally, if you're surrendering to God, ultimately what you're doing is you're just surrendering, period. Which means ignoring all your thoughts and not using your willpower in anything. That's what it means. And Very then you decide as you move, as you stay in that surrender, continuously mm -hmm. renewed surrender, you increasingly reside in a deeper and deeper peace. And finally, that peace will itself break apart the final you know, the final illusions. Makes sense. So, so let me ask you a follow-up question now, uh, because it's another assumption you just made here, which is that you're ignoring your thoughts, right? But I feel there are some aspects of my life or some moments, you might say, where I am, I'm experiencing a very, uh, uh, very visceral sensation. Sure. You know what I mean? And I don't feel those are thoughts. Sure. I feel sure thoughts arise as a reaction to the sensation maybe right and you can try to ignore them but i but then that doesn't solve the sensation problem so how do you apply your method to more like uh oh like i'm suffering I'm, su I'm suffering i'm experiencing like a uh, sensational emotions like i'm experiencing inner dissonance and i'm having feelings you know like how do you deal with that because yeah, I mean, the feelings can be there. You're not saying the feelings shouldn't be there. You're not saying the thoughts shouldn't be there. Even even when you ignore thoughts, you're not saying the thoughts have to disappear. Remember that very clearly. You do not thoughts do not have to disappear. <laughs> you're merely okay. recognizing that they are thoughts. Now, the truth is, even feelings 
are also thoughts because when you say I have a feeling, when you say, when you notice, as soon as you notice something, it can only be noticed through the organ of thought, basically. If, if, if it were just a feeling by itself without any thought attached, you would not even notice it, right? It would be, it would be as soon as you bring it into your attempt, your, the space where you say, I'm feeling, I'm feeling this sensation. Now you've incorporated thought into it, you might say. You know, the reality is that everything is incorporated. Thought has it. everything is infused with thought. Everything is infused. There's nothing which is not infused with thought. So, um, you can just view it as ignore everything if you like. Everything is thought, actually. And again, ignore does not mean that it has to go away. It just means that you're recognizing this is not me, and I don't have to have anything to do with it. I don't have to react to it. That's all. I, I need not react to it. It can be there. Let it be there, please. Be there, be there. I'm not saying go it's away. All, so it's a, it's a very weird way to like accept it, I feel, the way you're putting it. Yeah, well, it's accepting even your non-acceptance because you may feel like I wish things were different. To that wish, you don't, you're not saying that wish has to, has to change. You're accepting that wish for things to be different. So... Hmm. Uh, the one thing that I was slightly, I'm like, hmm, was in the in the dialogue, and maybe I misheard it, but you said uh, you need a, a thought to put your attention on feeling. Is that what you said, or you meant well, something else? Right. Well, when 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 you become aware of a feeling, you uh -huh. are definitely cognize it in the process. I Meaning, you definitely infused yeah. it with thought for sure. You cannot be aware of any feeling without it having a thought component. I don't understand. Can you like elaborate? Yeah, because when you say I'm experiencing a feeling, whether mm -hmm. or not you even use those words or not, sure. that is a thought. It's the thought that I'm noticing a feeling, right? I'm feeling something. As soon as you notice it, it's a feeling. Now it's a thought, it's the thought of a feeling. The thought, I'm noticing a feeling. That's the thought. Uh huh. Okay. So, okay. Cool. So you're saying you're putting your awareness on the feeling, and then as a reaction to that, there's a thought that arises, which says, "I'm noticing a thought." Well, yeah. And even, then, right. Well, I mean, even, even even putting your awareness on the feeling, even that very moment, the moment you put your awareness on the feeling. Now that 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 very idea, the very idea that you can even do that. Is already a thought. The way I think about awareness or attention, even I think of it as a torchlight. You know, that's like point. That's like pointing at uh, like a like a circle of light somewhere, right? And I feel what thought does is just tells you, oh, point your torchlight here, point your torchlight there. Yeah, but the torchlight is itself. So you know, it, it, not that it really. <laughs> we're quibbling yeah. about words here the point you know the ultimate point is whether you want to call it the word thought or not thought the real point is that it is an um you might say it's an egoic operation okay oh the okay light, the torch light okay which illuminates something is a faculty of the ego so so the point is we have to recognize this is not us this is not true so wait so just mm, this is new to me so you're saying so so wait so you're saying that torchlight is also a faculty of ego yes yes the idea attention itself is is very pretty much the ego just about attention itself attention itself is almost the ego The idea that there's a torchlight is itself the ego, just about. I don't know. I probably have to inquire. Yeah. But so, uh, that's the honest answer. But let's say, because what I've always assumed is, let's say if I let go of all my ego, yeah, what would be left is like this awareness. Yeah, no. So that's, that's still, you're still in the ego. Ego is the idea that there's awareness like that. That's the ego. 
but then are you saying that uh, awareness is a consequence of ego? The kind of awareness that you think of awareness is definitely a <laughs> there is a you might argue there's there is sure, sure. higher awareness but that higher awareness is not the same as the awareness that we know as awareness the awareness that individuals know as awareness is already been modified so this is why in the classical tradition of vedanta, classical vedanta you have you know three states of consciousness you have waking dreaming and deep sleep okay so in waking and dreaming, you have the sense of individuality and you have objects. You have, I am somehow here inside and there's an outside, okay? In dream, it's a dream world. In the waking, it's the real world, whatever. Um, but in deep sleep, there's no such separation. In deep sleep, dreamless sleep, you don't have a sense of yourself as an individual. So, um, So in deep sleep, from the waking standpoint, it's like being unconscious. Yeah. But from the perspective of higher consciousness, it is not. It is being aware of uh, nothing, you might say, or no object. But it's not unconsciousness. It is, but, but that kind of consciousness is so alien to waking awareness that... Yeah it might as well not be awareness from the standpoint of waking awareness. So, so what, what, what Vedanta is trying to show all non dual is trying to show is you are not the awareness of waking of the waking state, which is a very specific kind of awareness, which is a dualistic awareness, sure. nor are you the unconsciousness of deep sleep or arguably the consciousness of deep sleep, which has no, separation and which seems like darkness um yeah you are not one and not the other but you are something which like triangulating which gives rise to both which is neither light nor darkness it's neither separate nor together but it's capable of illuminating either interesting yeah so yeah so you're losing me there and i think I think, yeah, I think you would probably lose me there because the kind of quality, the symbols that you're using to like talk about it, I just don't have the direct experience of it. No. So no matter what symbols you use, it's just not going to point no, to that. It would a lot more to... to yeah, of course. It. Yeah, uh, but, but, out of, oh, yeah, but out of curiosity, uh, and I'm going to ask you a very specific question here. And, uh, and I'm going to use... Oh, a very specific... I have about 10 minutes left and then I have to get going just to let you know. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, thanks a lot though for the call. Sure. Uh, so let me like ask the final question and then we can like end it, which is like, so the, let's say the quality of awareness, the thing I have, and by quality, I mean like, you know, when I physically like, you know, the direct experience of it, right. That's what I mean by quality of something. Okay. Right? The direct, my, my direct experience of it without any symbols, right. Of awareness of my waking awareness. And if you actually inquire into the quality of the, the alien awareness, let's call it that right? Is it different or is it same? I don't know. I'm asking out of curiosity. Well, so you're asking me when, when you, you know, when you're inquiring into the quality of your awareness right now, is it different or is it the same as the higher awareness? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Me? Yeah. Like the, the sub, like, like the substance of it, you know, like, see the substance is it already, see already the problem is the very terms you're using are showing the radical difference, which is, which is, yeah. Awareness, as you think about it right now, is, yeah. first of all, an object of which you can be aware and which has certain substance, certain quality. Those are all object, aspects of objects. The higher consciousness, which we're just using that word for, it's not really sure. exactly that, is not something of which you can be aware and mm -hmm. does not have any substance to it, nor does it lack substance does not have any qualities to it, nor does it lack qualities, it can't be fit into the same framework. So that said, you know, that said, that said, of course, I could say not gonna not, not that it's gonna help you very much because it's gonna sure. be, it's confusion is at every level because this is the way that <laughs> illusion works. But sure. uh, <laughs> waking awareness with its so-called qualities and its so-called substance is what I would call a 
reflection of higher consciousness. So it bears the same relationship to it as a mirror reflection does. That's the closest analogy we can come. Cool. Yeah, cool. I think, yeah, it's something I have to like inquire and investigate for myself. But thanks for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure, right? I Thank really loved so our conversation. Uh, yeah, and I, I love the definitions and I love uh, the care you take for the words you use and like the distinctions you make. And I think that's really helpful. And I think it's really unique. It's very hard to find that style of non-duality, I think in YouTube at least. Uh, thanks for coming on. Is there anything, fa final thing you would like to like say, you know? Nope. Uh, no, thank you for having me on. And uh, it was a pleasure. Cool. Take care. It was an absolute pleasure. You too. Take All right. Care. Bye. Yeah, bye-bye.